what drew me to the, the medium of video games was a love of games, simple as that. Uh, I, I was a casual gamer. I was a, a, a player of Dungeons and Dragons and tweaky little board games that no one remembers. And uh, when electronic games uh, started to become a factor in, in, in the world and in my life, uh, they just kind of took over. You know, I, I, I was playing games obsessively. Uh, and it was a natural progression uh, to, to start making them, or at least to want to make them. Everything I've done has come out of board games. I've been thinking about that a lot recently. Uh, you know, I, I talk a lot about, about uh, games as a unique medium, uh, and video games as a unique medium. But when I look back at my, uh, my career, I guess, at this point, uh, what I see is uh, every game is an attempt to recreate the experience I had in 1977, 1978, when I started playing Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, all I want to do is create situations where players can participate in the telling of a story. So it's uh, about collaborative storytelling. Even if it's just one person sitting alone in a room with a game that I helped create, uh, that experience is a dialogue between me and the player. In I hope the same way uh, I had a dialogue with a game master uh, back in the 70s when I was playing D&D obsessively and you know, preparing to flunk out of college and everything like that. Games do one thing that no other medium in the world can do, and that's allow participation on the part of the user. That's the only thing we do that is unique. But it is the thing we do that is unique. So how could we not do that? How could we not strive to do that better and better with every game? If all you're doing is putting the player on rails and, and trying to disguise those rails and give the player false choices that don't really matter, I mean, if that's all you're doing, just go make a movie. Get out of my medium. Go make a movie. I was a role-playing guy hating every role-playing game I played. I mean, it seemed like nobody wanted to do anything in the electronic game space other than literally recreate Dungeons & Dragons. You know, and I, I want to recreate the feeling of playing d and I want to recreate the feeling of collaborative storytelling and of being there with, you know, six really smart, clever, creative people and working together to, you know, screw over the game master or accomplish whatever goal we were, we were set in, in a particular adventure. But I never, never wanted to roll secret dice behind the scenes and, you know, an electronic dice. Let's, you know, recreate the D&D rule set levels. I mean, the fact that today role playing is defined by I have 17 80th level characters. It's like, that's pathetic, you know. And, and so I'm still frustrated by this. I mean, role-playing should be about, I don't know, playing a role maybe? It's not about rolling dice. It's not about what level I am. It's not about my character class. That's horrible. And I wish everybody in the game business would stop doing it. And I really felt that strongly in 1995 and 96. And so I, I just wrote an article about how we have better ways to simulate things than rolling dice. And, and that's kind of where it started. And from there, I just said, I'm going to make a role-playing game that makes you feel like you're in another world, that makes you feel like you are actually an actor in another world, and you are playing a role, you know? What role do you want to play? It's kind of up to you. And I, and I wrote up those, those rules to, to get at what I thought we needed to do to replace those old rules. Yeah, Deus Ex started out, uh, I, I described it as the real-world role-playing game. That was the first sort of one-liner about it. Uh, the second one was, what happens if you take James Bond and drop him into a world that's not black and white, good and evil, but all shades of gray? Um, and those, those ideas, you know, the, 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 they were important uh, starting points for me, for everything that, that I thought about about the game. Uh, and then there was, there was one, other, one other thing. We were heading up uh, to the millennium. And I remember uh, like going online and watching television and reading the newspaper. And everything was about the upcoming apocalypse, you know. Y2K, Y2K, world's going to end. You know, conspiracies everywhere. The Bilderberg Group, oh, the Illuminati are in charge. You know, it's like, it was, what is going on in the world? And I just remember being, you know, totally... Uh, Intrigued by that, uh, but that inspiration was everywhere. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, Blade Runner was a huge influence. Uh, uh, I was really into cyberpunk science fiction at the time, so that that played a part. You know, I was reading a lot uh, about nanotechnology, which was 
both the, the, the thing that was going to save the world or maybe destroy it. You know, I mean, Michael Crichton was writing best-selling novels about the, the danger of nanotechnology. And, and so, you know, you just kind of soak it all in and uh, throw it all into the pot. Uh, you know, my, uh, my team's always d- described me as, as a kitchen sink designer. Let's just throw everything in. Yeah, we'll pull this stuff out that doesn't work later, you know. Uh, don't worry about it. Just throw everything in there and stir it up and see what we got. What do we got? We have anything interesting? Oh, man, that smells really bad. Let's, let's try something else. Um, but we just threw all that stuff in, in the pot. And, uh, you know, we were lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time. The, the starting point for, for Disney Epic Mickey was um, let's make Mickey a video game hero. Uh, and, and I just thought, yeah, okay, let's do that. You know, I mean, Disney came to me. It wasn't like I went and said, I got to do a Mickey Mouse game. They, they, it was hugely flattering, obviously, but they came to me and asked if I was interested. And, uh, you know, when you, when you start thinking about this character that's been a, a part of all of our lives for 80 years uh, and has conquered every medium, I mean, whatever you think about the guy, you know, he was, for many years, the most popular movie character, movie star, human or cartoon. He was the most popular movie star in the world. And yet he hadn't been in any video games in six years and had never been as big a star as I thought he could be. So the opportunity to bring him to, to interactive life and make him as, as big a success in the game world as he's been in every other medium... That's a challenge you don't walk away from. So there was that. Uh, the opportunity to bring Oswald the Lucky Rabbit back. You don't walk away from that either. I mean, character lost to Disney uh, in 1928 in a contract dispute. Uh, and the first time he's going to appear on a screen anywhere is in your game? Yeah, okay. You don't say no to that. Uh, and then to be given basically free reign to, to go pouring through the archives and and bring back any aspect of Disney's history you want. Come on. I mean, how, do you, how does anybody in the world say no to that? So uh, it, it really was driven, though, just by a desire to make Mickey a hero, a video game hero. Uh, and I think we did a pretty good job of that. A lot of people in this business, I think, want to make cinematic adventures. They, want, they really want to be making movies. I mean, let's be clear, right? And, and to those people, I say, you know, really, I wish you would just go do that. Um, but uh, the interesting thing is I, I think I've had to unlearn more than I've learned. Uh, I, I, there's certainly some value in understanding cinematic storytelling techniques uh, because we do share some superficial similarities with, with movies. There's no question. Uh, so there's, there's value in understanding narrative structure. There's value in understanding how important camera placement is. There's value in understanding um, how editing can create tension through changing pacing and all that. Uh, but mostly, I think game developers need to shed the, the conventions of other media. Uh, and the more we do that, I think the better off we'll be. Uh, I'm a little concerned, actually, that uh, cinematic games seem to be making a bit of a comeback these days. And it's, it's great. You can be the hero of a movie, rah, rah. But uh, the more cinematic a game becomes, the less uh, power it leaves the player to participate. And so I think, I think there's a very delicate balance there, and um, I, I try to forget most of my cinematic training, actually, and focus on the training I got at the, the school of Steve Jackson Games and the school of, uh, of TSR uh, and, and try to apply that to my work. Game development is more art than science. A lot of people think it's in, you know, a project schedule and therefore it is real. Or, you know, we, we are writing code and we will control the world. Or It, it doesn't work that way. Uh, it's, it, game development is, is about trial and error. It's about constant iteration. It's about writing things down on paper, thinking they're going to be fun, uh, and playing them, implementing them, and realizing they're not fun. It's about constant conversation and dialogue among team members. Uh, and so it's not so much that we applied those ideas in specific ways. It's that every piece of work we did, we were able to, to uh, filter the work, 
you know, or look at it through the lens of those, those ideas. Uh, and so it was, I think, a good starting point and a good ending point for everything we did. Having, having a, a, a clear goal and uh, it being able to use those ideas as tests uh, when we finished something. Uh, and then we could redo it if it didn't work. Okay? Uh, and that's pretty much the way I work even now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love the beginning phases of a project. What is this game? How do we answer those questions? How do we realize the, the ideas that come out of those questions in some interesting and meaningful way? And then the end product, the, the end of the project, uh, also I love that stuff. How do we take this thing that's finished but not fun, which is inevitable, and make it fun and make it express all those ideas we had in the beginning? And then there's this, you know, for me, two or three year middle period of let's grind it out where I basically say, okay, boys, see you later. <laughs> Go make the game. I'll come back in about a year and talk to you then. Uh, <laughs> It's kind of, I shouldn't admit that, actually. It's kind of embarrassing. But I, like, that whole production phase, if I could just like, go to Acapulco or something and sit on a beach you know, during that, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. Concept and closure, those are, the, those are the, the good parts. And that's where rules like that become really important, right? What are we trying to accomplish? Have we accomplished it? And you know, in the middle, you hope everybody's sort of thinking about that, but fundamentally you don't care because you know you're going to have that phase at the end of you know, as much time as you can get to make this unfun thing fun and magical and beautiful and wonderful. I long ago gave up being embarrassed about the statement, video games are art. They are, get over it, okay? Uh, if you don't believe it, it just means that you know, you're a dinosaur and you haven't figured it out yet. Neither you'll figure it out or time will do its business and eventually you will become irrelevant. Um, I, I know so many people in this, this business, so many creative people, whose working methods, whose goals, whose aspirations are the same as people who work with brushes and paint or who work with you know, celluloid and, and linear media uh, or who uh, work with guitars and pianos and tubas. It's the same thing. We are, we are expressing ourselves through our work we are making what can be important thematic points. Uh, all of my games are about dysfunctional families or people too old to be doing what they're doing but doing it because they have to. Those are the only two stories I've ever told. You know, um, There's a thematic consistency in, in our work. There is uh, personal style expressed in our work. What we do that's different is we bring viewers uh, into the into the, the the secret sort of sacred circle, and we make them participants. That's the only thing that makes us different. And to say that that is enough to define us as not art drives me nuts. You know, it's just it's silly. Uh, again, I know how the the people in this exhibition think, and they think as artists. Their work is art, uh, and it's entirely appropriate that that it be displayed in a gallery. I don't envy anybody who has to figure out how to do it. You know, how do you, how do you accurately portray a 20-hour experience in a gallery experience? Ah, pff, no idea. Someone else's job, luckily. But that is a problem worth solving, and games are a medium worth recognizing in, in that context. People in, in you know, the, the, the 16th century did not know that Shakespeare was going to be important hundreds of years in the future. Um, in the, the, the teens and 20s and 30s, people who said that movies were worthy of study were ridiculed. Uh, in the 19th century, people who thought novels were worthy you know, of, of study, it was like kids shouldn't be reading about life. They should be out living it. No one knows. And as, a, as a, a scholar, there was a point in my life where I was a scholar, you know, and I was doing original research in, in archives, studying uh, the history of film. And what I discovered very quickly was most of film history was lost forever. 80% of silent films no longer exist. We will never, ever, ever see them. And I just, when I got into this business, I just said, we can't allow that to happen. We might be important. We might not, you know? Games might end up being forgotten, 
uh, a fad that passed you know, very quickly, or we might end up being the medium of the 21st century that 500 years from now, people really are going to want to know about. And I just vowed that I would not be a party to losing history.